everyone. Today we have Alex Bonori with us and we're going to talk about how small and medium businesses can use AI in advertising. Um, so I'm really lucky to have you here, Alex. Um, one of the senior people who used to work at Google and, and in advertising agencies long before that as well. So you have a lot of experience in advertising and now you are very much into artificial intelligence. So um, today we're going to talk about how AI can, can impact advertising for small and medium businesses. Do you want to introduce yourself quickly, Alex? Yeah, sure, with pleasure. Um, my name is Alex Bernotti. I'm a senior director of branding at G42, which is a huge um, AI group uh, born in the Middle East in 2018 and located in Abu Dhabi uh, and today is considered one of the giants of the artificial intelligence play field. Um, and as you said, before this I've been eight years at Google, taking care of all the creative efforts for all our biggest clients in Middle East, Turkey, Africa as well. So, and before that I spent my life in advertising agencies as an ECD for Macan in Italy for Publicis here in uh, in Dubai. So, as you said, probably I have a decent amount of experience uh, combining these three um, three kind of uh, experiences I have led through my life. So, I wanted to talk first about how AI can change some of the processes of of making a great advertising campaign. Uh, so obviously you, you work with some of the, the biggest brands, but here I wanted to focus a little bit on how AI can help some of the small and medium businesses achieve great results. Can you try and describe kind of the process of, of creating a great campaign traditionally and, and how that looks different when you use AI? Yeah, I actually think that um, SMEs are in the right position to start using AI immediately even more than the traditional giant clients and with more benefits. And I will try to unpack it and explain why. So anyone who is familiar with an advertising campaign process, he knows that it starts with the client having a brief for the agency. And then the agency takes uh, time to digest the brief, create a strategy based upon that brief, then giving that strategy as a brief to a creative department in order to produce ideas for, for the campaign. And this campaign could be as simple as, I don't know, a social media post or as big as a fully integrated campaign that lasts year long with tens of assets of all kinds, right? So it can be very small or very big, but the process remains more or less identical. The only thing that changes is the complexity and the scheduling of all this thing and the number of people involved. But bare bones speaking is the same thing. Now, um, if you look at how a creative agency traditionally works, once this ideation process has been done, which happens in house, right? So creatives in the agency will pitch back to the client ideas and will do that with storyboards, which are, you know, those small big nets that are the basis for a movie or sometimes with more advanced animatics, stylomatics, uh, so pieces of animation, animated video that somehow mimics the final result or point towards the final result. Then the client, based on these, uh, uh, on these proposals, picks and, and chooses the campaign that um, answers in the best possible way to the strategic objectives. And then it starts the, the painful, expensive, and sometimes very long production process, which means you have to identify the talent that will shoot that video. Now we are speaking video, but it's the same with a photography or an illustration, right? You have to find someone that will create the final artwork. And, and then you have to, maybe it's a pitch against production companies to find the, the one that has the best offer. And then you have to understand the directors, the talent that you have at your disposal. And then there will be a director treatment which will finally output the storyboard, which at this point has become a shooting board, which means what you see on paper is exactly what will get shot on the stage with the actors, the props and all of that. So I would say that videos by nature, uh, even though they are the most 
used form of communication, the most important as such, is also the most complex and most expensive form of comms for any, any brand, right? And of course, SMEs may have tighter budgets, which sometimes makes a clear cut um, that says you cannot do video. You don't have the money to do that video. Or you cannot do two videos. You have to pick and choose which one we will do, and so on and so forth. So what Gen AI can do, and is already doing, quite frankly, brilliantly, is uh, giving SMEs the opportunity to internalize part of the process um, and, and actually create assets that are extremely well executed. Now we are at the stage where images, I would challenge people saying uh, that it's easy to distinguish between what has been generated and what was once done through photography or illustration, right? If you know how generative AI works, if you master one of the platforms or more platforms and you prompt them in the best possible way, you will end up with something that is definitely has the same production values of some of the best artworks that were produced without Gen AI. So it's not a, it's not a lesser choice, let me say. When it comes to images, it can be on par and then, of course, you will always have incredible peaks of excellence done with real photographers, real illustrators that are difficult to replicate uh, with, with an artificial intelligence. But here we are not discussing those extreme peaks. We are actually discussing how can small enterprises be active in the advertising domain and space with, with more qualitative assets that don't cost them as much as they do normally. So in terms of images, I would say we are already there. And it's, uh, it's a no-brainer for me. Uh, instead of spending thousands of dollars for a set with actors, models, and a photograph, you can 100% go uh, Gen AI. And, and uh, as a result, you will have better um, assets and more assets, because then you are limited only by your uh, time and, and skills. Uh, because you can generate a fantastic image in no more than 20 seconds if you know how to prompt it. And then, of course, the process can take longer, but it's uncomparable. Now, when it comes to video, it's a bit of a different thing, uh, I would say, because video is catching up, is immensely more difficult than images to, to be produced with Gen AI. There are so many factors, including the size of the databases, the samples, how the model learn. And there is so many complexities linked to the movement in the space and the 3D. So uh, I would say that Gen AI, when it comes to video, is at the same stage now that images Gen AI uh, models were maybe one and a half year ago which means it's catching up brilliantly, right? Very quickly. Yeah. Have you been able to, to test Sora yet? Or, or have you just like the rest of us uh, just seen the, the, these demos? I'm like the rest of us. I've just seen these beautiful demos. Um, but I have to say that I'm impressed, right? Because I was, uh, I'm using normally a runway. Um, there are many you, you can, and actually, you will see that the most uh, expert workflow sometimes combines more of these technologies together to get the final result, right? Because you can generate an image in mid-journey, put it in runway and generate your first four second segments. If there is a spoken word, now you have two or three options for lip syncing that are working incredibly well. So, and then you can, you can also resort to more traditional uh, methods like Adobe After Effects to add some post-production or color grading. So you can, depending how skilled you are in using those softwares, you can either create a completely uh, Gen AI workflow or an integrated hybrid Gen AI plus traditional technologies workflow, and they will both deliver. So when it comes to Sora, I was impressed because the other engines are nowhere near that kind of output. I've also seen just um, the day before yesterday here in Dubai at the Lynx, uh, one of my ex-colleagues at Google, Melin Swildens, presented um, a deck on what, what Google is doing in the space of Gen AI. 
and as exciting as the old deck was, and of course that there are research papers that are brilliant. So it kind of shows you what is cooking, but on the video front, she presented a snapshot of what a Lumiere, that is the name of the, of the video platform that uh, Google is, is baking. To me, it wasn't as good as Sora was lagging behind. So Sora has really taken the world by storm and by surprise. Do you, then in, in like two years time that you can control the video to an extent where you would upload your brand assets, let's say you're advertising a, a soft drink, for example. So you might upload the brand asset, then design uh, the models, the people who are going to drink it, and, and in that way control the environment. Because I guess right now it's still a little bit lock of the draw what you're getting, at least unless you are a real, really professional prompt engineer. Yeah, I would say that that is an, uh, that kind of output and the level of control you want to have is highly dependent on the skill of the user because if you just input any text then it's a it's a lucky strike or not and you you have to repeat the procedure many times to get something that you like and then there is coherence and consistency but don't forget that these models can be trained so for example in the region we are working with um, another text to image model which is called musabir which is quite interesting because it's culturally sensitive and it doesn't output caricatures of local cultures. It outputs genuine. So if you ask for an Emirati man, what will output is an actual Emirati man, not a stereotype image of any any Arab or, or a caricature of an Emirati man for, for lack of culturally relevant sensitivities and, and details. So this text to video, text to image engine is quite interesting and they can for small and medium enterprises they can have a model trained on your brand specifically so you can have it's not the public usage kind of thing where you use the model that has been trained but you could and should train your own model with the colors of your brand with the assets of your brand so that it reflects the spirit of your brand more that facilitate outputting images that are coherent with the with the brand and of course the more these models get adopted by the the, the industry the more technologies uh, surface that can help that so now there are models that can really replicate your brand perfectly or the product perfectly across shots and stuff like that so in in um, hindsight and looking at what has happened with the text to image models i would say that between one year and two years from now, um, we will be with video at the same level of quality that we are with images now, which means any brand can produce videos and, and images um, basically without uh, having to, to go for traditional shooting technologies. So how do you expect this to impact uh, the industry? So, so you talked about taking some of the processes in-house but, but do you see a future where small and medium businesses do not use uh, agencies or do you see them using agencies in a different way or do you see them using other partners like prompt engineers, for example, to, to reach these results? There will, be, there will be a spectrum of possibilities, right? Which somehow is, is already happening. So we have seen that Many clients are internalizing the creative process already, even with traditional techniques, um, just because traditional agencies were a bit either slow or, or um, expensive to produce the number of assets that an actual digital strategy, well done digital strategy could require. Right? Because we haven't touched on this, but one of the greatest opportunities of Gen AI for images and video is the possibility to produce more assets and therefore to have micro-targeting done well or targeting done well, where you can talk to specific groups of, of potential uh, users with a, a, a tailored message, which we tried to do in the last few years. We tried to say, yes, this is a, a, a multi-targeting campaign, but at the end of the day, you end up with three, four assets that are barely different. And, hint at different target audiences. What we're discussing here is the possibility to actually have a strategy where for each relevant audience, 
you produce a creative asset that is entirely tailored for that audience. And you can do that really at scale. So first of all, this can bring um, targeting done well. This can bring to life the possibility um, of, of targeting and using the platforms for what they do best, which is taking assets and distributing them to these target audiences. When it comes to the model, um, I would say it really depends. Um, I would say that a hybrid model is pretty much possible where either a client builds a small creative department, which doesn't need more than a couple of people to produce these assets, right? You don't need a producer. You don't, you just need to skilled prompters that maybe have spent years in the advertising industry. They know how it works and they can join the dots and use the new technologies. So it could be internal agencies, um, producing that I can see it happening very easily. It could be that traditional agencies um, for clients that have either less budget or ample needs of assets will implement some of these technologies. So like in their offerings, they will have the traditional methodology for bigger hero campaigns and stuff like that, but they will also offer clients a mixed model where they can actually have generated assets for a fraction of the price uh, of a big campaign. And in between, I can also see either the birth of entirely Gen AI agencies, which could happen, could, could be already happening for what I know, right? So it, it doesn't take a, a village to understand the opportunity and that with, with a very small investment, uh, smart, skilled, creative people can now be a powerhouse of production as well. So I could see that happening easily. I could see production companies, traditional production companies, adopting a bit of Gen AI to, to survive. I can see that as well. Um, and there will be a um, huge uh, offering in terms of freelance marketing, right? We, we are going towards a fragmentation of talent where a small company could actually look on the market for a freelancer that takes the needs and executes them beautifully and, and doesn't have to invest in ad counts as well. So all of this is a spectrum and really depends on um, the budget that, that the client is putting behind the creation of assets and uh, how quickly people embrace this technology. At the moment, creative agencies are using Gen AI mostly to propose ideas and to do storyboarding, but they're not going to Gen AI when it comes to the final, final asset. Um, others are starting to use it for visuals. So I've already seen campaigns that are done with Gen AI, where the visual is uh, done with Gen AI. So it's, it's very clear that is happening. And um, yeah, and, and that will be the more we streamline the process and we get a higher qualitative output, the more these models interact, the, the quicker the world of production will change. It's not going to be the same as we knew it. In a couple of years, max is going to be a very different game. But it's an interesting point uh, in terms of, of the process, I think, because usually for, for smaller companies with a limited budget, they would create some sort of brief to the ad agency, um, but perhaps they had a, a less professional marketing department who are not used, uh, that used to creating these briefs. So it might not contain all the information and they might imagine a specific output, but they're not quite able to communicate that to the ad agency. But, but it's an interesting opportunity, I think, that now they can create their own storyboard, say, I'm, I'm expecting something like this. I'm not a prompt engineer, but I think it's also a way of communicating the idea, right? Uh, do you see it as a, a way of opening the communication? It could totally be, it could totally be. There are clients that are already doing experiments and generally these experiments are a workshop where you go from zero to asset and you use maybe chat GPT, even to do the creative idea for yourself or the strategy and so on and so forth. And then there, everyone is happy because it's a funky experience, but it's not still a process. It's not seriously implemented, right? But you can, you could actually do that because we have just touched on the the uh, last mile we have touched on production of either images or videos but what if you actually ideate with gen ai 
uh, and, and what happens when there will be models that are trained. You could do it today. You could take chat GPT, create your own GPT for uh, creative ideas and, and train a model on the best advertising ideas that have been out there in the last decades and, and start to have back from the machine some actually viable ideas. So the, the, a marketing department, first of all, marketing should always be spearheading innovation. Uh, if, if they aren't, no one else will. It's, uh, it's a new world. In the old world, agencies would push the client out of their comfort zone. Today, it's almost the other way around. It's clients that need to, sh to push agency out of their comfort zone, which means that there has been a shift in, in the awareness of what communication and ideas uh, are and, and internalizing the companies more and more. And I, I think it's inevitable for marketeers to be very expert of Gen AI because they will encounter an opportunity or a problem at some stage of their life uh, sooner rather than later. So to be able to take those opportunities and avoid those problems, everyone in marketing should become, let's say, not an expert because no one is really an expert of a technology that is developing, but at least um, an, an expert user, let's say. So roll up your sleeves, do some courses. There are amazing online free courses on what Gen AI models are and can do. So just start to get there. And then, yeah, subscribe to one of these platforms and start playing with it. And then you will have a better conversation with their agencies as well. I think that brings up a very important point. Um, I think a lot of small and medium-sized businesses, the challenge is that they're caught up in the day-to-day, -day, right? The, the amount of time and resources they have to invest in the, the developing their company. Uh, is often relatively limited. So, so I can imagine a lot are sitting, you know, waiting to start with AI, but not really knowing where to begin. Would you have some advice to these companies? I mean, where would you begin with you? Would you begin with ChatGPT or, or MidJourney or, or how should they start their AI journey, journey in terms of advertising? Okay, so what I would do um, would be, first of all, take one of these generic courses. Because when we say AI, it's such a wide concept, right? And there's so much more than Gen AI that they could use for their business. There is predictive modeling, so much, right? So we are just talking about Gen AI because it's the hot topic of the moment and it's the more visual one that is challenging our notion. So, of course, we are talking about it. But AI is much broader concept. So first, do one of those full courses on AI, introductory, basic level. And again, Google does it, Amazon offers them, Microsoft offers them, AWS from Amazon. So they are all over the place. Uh, you, you, you don't need not even to pay for these courses. They are free. So devote some of your personal time in at least understanding the landscape. What is Gen AI? What Gen AI can do? Then. Once you have this broader picture in front of you, you can start chipping in those spaces that are relevant for you. And, and of course, ChatGPT is a good way, or Gemini, or whatever other model is out there, is a good way to start. But ChatGPT, like MidJourney, if you, it's garbage in, garbage out. You cannot expect an LLM to, to be very significant if you don't prompt it well. It's exactly the same as with a creative agency. If you give them a shitty brief, you cannot expect a great result, right? So the way you interact with these models will make the difference. You can train them. You can actually build your own GPTs with, with the OpenAI approach. So once you start using it and get a first sense of what this LLM can do for you, um, then I'm pretty sure everyone will have an appetite to understand more and do a bit more. Same with image generation. Um, it, I am a, an early adopter, so I go on all the forums, I talk to the people, I do my own prompting, um, and I try to innovate as much as I can. Now I understand that's not the, the common approach for, for a small business, but still you can take a quick start guide and try imagining your product in a context and 
and see what happens, right? I think there is nothing better than getting your hands dirty a bit to understand these, these things. And yes, complicated lies, but then it's a matter of survival of the fittest. And if you don't get your hands dirty with these, um, what else do you do with your time? Because yes, tactical day-to-day -day is essential, but strategic um, long-term vision is more essential. So any company, even if they're struggling, they should save a bit of time to, to project their thinking further and to adopt innovation because someone else will do it, if not you, and that will be probably the competitor that will win your market share. I think that's a very important point and, and I couldn't agree more. Um, do you see examples right now of, of small and medium-sized companies really using AI in well, especially marketing, uh, or do you think they are a little bit slow to, to adapt and to take advantage of these uh, new capabilities? Look, as I told you, I've seen it happening already in the wild. Uh, in Italy, there is a newspaper. They have, um, they have a product that they sell, and I've been seeing for the last three months them campaigning with Gen AI generated images. And it's out there, right? It's public. It's a campaign. It's not an experiment. They decided that we are not going to shoot or use stock images. We are going to go with AI and we're going to create our own testimonials, our own people to, to sell this. So it's already happening. It's not a matter of uh, will it happen. It's already happening. And other brands are using it uh, more shy, in a bit more shy way. They're doing internal stuff with Gen AI. And then for external, they're still reluctant. And sometimes it also depends on the quality because Gen AI, up until very recently, was out uh, was giving output images that were not really high quality in terms of resolution, so it wasn't really possible to use them. But today, first of all, they are already um, giving us an output very decently sized images, and with AI you can uh, upscale those images without losing details. It's the opposite. Actually, you can use upscale as a increase in quality kind of approach uh, and this is happening both on video and image so now it can be you can do a big outdoor with a with a, a gen ai image and people will not say oh that looks shitty they actually say oh that looks good and you can see a lot of real estate is using gen ai architecture to lure clients in and and so on and so forth so if you look carefully, it's it's already very present in the market, very present. Videos, not as much. You can use videos to do a GIF kind of short animation, more conceptual. That I see it happening. Uh, I can see this in the wild. And as I said, to get real videos out in the wild with the quality that we expect from advertising, it will take one, one and a half, two years but then it will become the norm for many, many uh, clients. So looking at AI creatives and, and AI art, I guess some people, they, they kind of say, well, if I can tell it's AI, it's, it's not great. Other people see AI as an art form in itself, right? Say, well, this is different from anything I've ever seen before. You know, this is interesting. Where do you see AI? Do you see it as a goal to make AI advertising so nobody can see it's AI advertising? Or do you think it's cooler to create AI advertising that is clearly AI, but different to something we've, we've seen before? Uh, that's a very, very smart question. And uh, you can guess the answer. I'm a creative, so I'm extremely interested in every new form of expression, right? If you look at photography, would you say that Polaroid is not real photography? Uh, it, it created a genre, it created um, a look and feel, right? Because just because it was poor, it didn't mean it wasn't legit. So, and, and with Gen AI, um, I'm, I'm a big uh, Midjourney fan. I use it since uh, it wasn't public. So I was in the bit, in the close bit of Midjourney. And version by version, what I really like about Midjourney is the extensive knowledge of the art scene and the art references Midjourney has. So with Midjourney, you can go 
towards realism and produce an output that looks like a photo. But it's much more exciting to, to go in a, in a great zone where you don't distinguish very well if it's an illustration or a photo. And that's the beauty of it. So Gen AI is creating also. Now I can, I can see, you know, with the visual, I can say, oh, that has been done with version 3, that looks version 5.2. That, and it's exactly the same as photographers knowing the grain of the film uh, when they see a, a picture printed, they says, oh, this must has been shot with, I don't know, a Fuji and so forth. So it's really another palette of possibilities, but you can go fully realistic as well. And it really depends on what, what do you want to do with that? We are seeing that for, I, I, I mentioned the architectural uh, renderings, right? There are some amazingly beautiful renderings done with Gen AI of, houses that don't exist in real life and you wish they could exist in real life which means that probably the model is outputting a more inspiring version of what you would have if you have a very traditionally strict um, photography kind of model that outputs just reality so you can go beyond reality and you can inspire reality in fact fashion is embracing it because I've seen amazing fashion collection that were designed with, with Gen AI and could be legit in any fashion show. And it's not poor quality, it's actually inspiring. So some of the way these models work can offer us more creativity. That's how I, I see my interaction with these models is I see them as creative partners, not as you know executors of something I want them to do. I'm always ready to embrace a different point of view that comes from how the model has been trained, which is amazing. I guess there's a lot of discussion about the legal issues, right? I mean, it, it, I guess it's whether it's advertising or, or it's art, right? Who, who does the copyright belong to, right? Does it belong to the prompt engineer or does it belong to, to the images that the AI model has been trained on. What are your own con considerations uh, regarding the legal aspects, especially within, within advertising? So there are a few considerations that need to be done. The first one is that regulations are slower than the developing of these models, which means that we find ourselves unprepared to be as quick as the pace of technology which poses a problem per se, right? So, and it's not about just the images and copyright. This is about how do we regulate AI models in order to still be a functioning society that pay dividends to, you know, intellectual rights holders. And how do we make it fair? And how do we make sure that this contributes to the general well-being and, and wealth and growth? And this is not on the models. The way these models have been built, it follows more of a scientific approach, which is this is the science. Now cope with it, uh, which happened in, in science since the, the day. And, and obviously the atomic energy being the most relevant example. You can, you're, it's neutral. You are not shaping the way society needs to think, but you can do great things with that, but also horrible things with that, right? So if you take a Gen AI model and you just mimic 100% the style of, of a living artist, it's not illegal, but it's unethical, right? So what these models, because, um, and, and this doesn't belong just to Gen AI at all, because I can quote a very, very interesting case, which has been um, Avatar versus Roger Dean. Now, for people that are versed in both movies and science fiction and illustration, uh, Avatar has been an amazing movie. Uh, visually, when it came out, everyone was blown away by the beauty of this alien world. And it was just something new, never seen before. And everyone was like raving about the visual style of Avatar. And then you have this guy called Roger Dean. And Roger Dean is a, a very famous illustrator. And his work goes back to the 70s, where he became more or less known to a wider public by doing uh, some of the most revered uh, Yes covers for their albums, the, the progressive rock band. 
If you go just there, you will see that this is where uh, the, the world of Avatar was built upon. They literally stole his whole conception of an alien world and uh, alien, alien fauna and flora and brought it to life. And that was very, very jarring to see how much they stole of the vision of the artist. And you would expect that they would pay a dividend to this artist, right? But they didn't. They just ignore. And he had a lawsuit, and the lawsuit concluded that it was not possible to give money to Roger Dean because it's very hard to um, copyright style. And this is what we are talking about, because when you do with something in Gen AI in the style of, the output will not be an actual picture of that painter or photographer or whatever will be a statistical inference of how the pixels are arranged throughout the style of that painter or photographer or whatever, so that it will remind you of that artist, but there will not be something that has been borrowed exactly from that artist. Now, if you look at that, um, don't we all do the same? So any creative person goes out there, sees it's our model, inner model, is looking, just looking. You see images, you see photographs, you see paintings, you absorb them, you mix them, remix them, make them yours, and then you have your own work, which may be reminiscent for an aspect of, of, of another artist. So art has always been borrowing previous styles, always. You will never find a single artist that has done something that is entirely new. It always refers back to someone that has done it before him with some differences. Yes, I, I guess it's all about what you are influenced by at the moment. Uh, I guess nobody quite knows how the human brain works, but, but I'm not sure it's so different from an AI in terms of the way it's inspired by a whole range of, of other art and then it, it outputs something. But I guess some small and medium business um, uh, companies would say, but should they dare to use AI art? I mean, could, could they risk a lawsuit? Um, what, what advice would you give them? I know you're not a lawyer, but I'm more thinking, I mean, if you stay within more general prompts that does not like mimic something very, very specific, like a specific artist or a very specific setting, do you think that would avoid uh, any risk of getting into to legal issues later on? Look, I am the, the last person that can speak of legal matters. I would say I wouldn't see a risk in, in these, um, just for the simple reason that, again, I w what I'd be mindful of is if the artist or the photographer you're trying to mimic is alive and working, it may be different than an artist of the past, right? So if you do something in the style of Rembrandt, there have been thousands of painters mimicking his style for their own paintings. You cannot copyright that. But if you do something in the style of, let's say, a modern photographer that is still active and working, then that photographer may be pissed to the point of seeing if there is ground for a legal action. Having said that, I'm not even sure that action would uh, end with the artist winning because of the examples I, I cited, right? Like the Roger Dean. Think about music is exactly the same. When Star Wars came out, the whole Star Wars soundtrack has been heavily borrowed by previous composers. Uh, John Williams literally stole the style of the arrangement of I don't know, Mars, uh, the, the better of war of the Gustav Holst Planet Symphony. And the, the whole main team was modeled on a famous soundtrack of the 40s, a composer of the 40s. So the, the, you can almost see where everything came about. And, and there were, you know, record companies holding the rights for that music. So why didn't those record companies uh, brought to court John Williams? Because it's extremely difficult to draw a line between inspiration and plagiarism, between style and the execution. And it, 
it's in the way the world works is we are always stealing visual, auditorial, sensorial cues and re-elaborates them. So it's a, it's a thorny issue. Um, I, I would say my best advice to the companies would be, yeah, first of all, there's no need to go specific and to, to run into a risk, right? So why do you want to do something that could endanger you? Don't go there. There are plenty of options to do it in a, in a safer way, which doesn't require uh, any, any lawyer involved. Um, and, and second, I would say, look at the rules and regulation of the countries you're in, because they may be different. The, one of the other things about AI is that since it's so new and so disruptive and so fast, no one is really nailing um, the rules and regulation about it. So Europe as a stance, this doesn't mean that the European stance is the same as the Middle Eastern one or the American one or the um, Chinese one. So first of all, get familiar with what's the state of the art of the rules and regulation about the usage of AI in your own market or in the market where you're going to put the assets that you create. Um, and then if, you, if you're if you still unsure, require a legal uh, assistance, um, you know, uh, what's the opinion of a lawyer on that? But I would say that given the experience I, I have had, even with advertising and even before Gen AI, it's very, very difficult that something uh, gets in the way of an idea that just mimics a style or borrows a style. Yes, I agree. I actually saw some advice um, from a creative agency saying, well, every artist will have uh, underlying tags in terms of their style, right? I mean, the period of their style, the lighting they use. So if you instead are precise in your prompt in what you're looking for to resemble a style instead of like a certain name, uh, then that would also be a way to, to make sure that there's no play. That's very technical, right? So what they're saying is don't write a prompt that has a name of an artist in your prompt, but describe his style so well that the final result will be any way in his style. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a shortcut it's fine for me it's conceptual is the same if the final result mimics that artist it doesn't matter if you just use his name or not it's more a problem for the platforms that the real issue is when platform trained those models on the work of living artists this is where the whole thorny issues lies right because it's these are artists that are professional, they're making a living out of their work. Maybe they studied 20 years to come up with that style and all of a sudden any 14 year old kid with a computer can do something that looks like they've been doing it. Uh, so it's clearly that there is the personal concern of those artists. And then there is a category concerns of illustrators and photographers that says, OK, what happens to my life now? Because I cannot sell any more for a certain price an artwork because most likely the other person will tell me, but I can do this with Gen AI and, and spend nothing. So there is a real problem around, uh, which has always been the case whenever there is an industrial kind of revolution, a disruption. Some jobs will be endangered, some others will be boosted, and some others will be created, right? So if you're an illustrator, you could say, I hate Gen AI and, and I don't want to have anything with it, but you could embrace it to produce more of your work, train a model on your own style, on your own work. So be completely owner of, of the output and being able, instead of taking just one job per week, to take 50 jobs per week. So it could make you richer and better at what you do and, and more wealthy. And it's always been like that. With, when Photoshop came out, when digital photography came out, when photography came out. And uh, of course, the painters were pissed off because they said, OK, now who's going to buy my painting if I can take a, a photograph of it? So we need to be, and of course, the, for the people that are impacted by this kind of revolutions is horrible. So I don't want to dismiss the personal aspect of it. But on if you look from a higher point of view, you see that, yes, there are jobs that are endangered, jobs that will be boosted if you embrace it, and then new jobs will be created that ideally will be more. W would you say that, I don't know, when the printing process was invented, 
uh, it took away more job than the ones he created. I would say it created definitely more jobs than when we were copying books by hand. Right? So every time there is a revolution, there is a buffer time where first of all, you understand what is happening. Then everyone starts to restructure their thinking and then, and then things change. So in the bigger scheme of things, we have seen it before. If you zoom in at the human level, it's impactful and it's dramatic. And we need to respect that. But you, you could say, of course, that the pace that this transformation is coming with is is faster than ever. And, and I also think it's faster than we anticipated. I remember speaking with you, I think it was in November. We we're talking about uh, generative art and, and also generative video. And maybe I'm, I'm uh, quoting you wrong here, but I think we talked about in two years time, you would be able to make really high quality video that could be used in an ad. And suddenly we, we now see something like Sora and this is four months later. I, I still, I still, am, I still am back in my prediction because I think Sora now has not been released. So before it gets released, before you start to adopt it and before it becomes proficient, it will take. So when I, when I say it back in November, in two years from now, I will be presenting on the same stage, my first TV series, I still stand by it. And I still think it will take two years to get to the point where I can actually do that. Right. So the, the, having said that, which is irrelevant, uh, we as humans, we are not good at predicting times. And it's not just because of AI, we are terrible predictor of time. Sometimes we, we say this will happen in 30 years and then the next year is there. And sometimes we say, this will happen tomorrow, and then it takes 30 years. Take virtual reality, uh, the whole metaverse kind of bullshit, I still call it. We have been talking about virtual reality for decades, decades on end. And it was the next thing, this is coming, this is going to be huge. It never happened. So that was an occasion in which we predicted a short term, which has become one of the longest terms ever, because we are not nearly there. And other times, like with Gen AI, we say, oh, okay, it will take, oh, this will never be uh, an art piece. This will never be a video. This will never be an image. And then three months down the line, there it goes. So I would say what you need to consider is what kind of technology goes with innovation and how fast is the, the curve of innovation in that technology, specific technology. So uh, how much, when you, we have done that with computing, how, how much time does it take for a processor to become this fast? And then we have seen those time shrinking, right? And miniaturization has gone along the same lines. So it would be wiser to think, okay, Gen AI is not something that is, you know, from Mars, is based on computing and is based on models and is based on algorithms. What are the components of these algorithms and what it takes to make a model incredibly effective? And you understand that there is not a big uh, curve going out there. It's going to happen quickly because it's just a matter of training resources, data sets, computing power. And all these things can be escalated quite quickly. Yeah, you're, you're right. We humans are really bad at, at predicting most of the time. but. Anyway, I, I wanted to, to pick your brain uh, in terms of creating a little bit of a timeline, right? So, so you still say in about two years or a little less, uh, we could make uh, real quality video advertising from tools like Sora, probably at that point, Sora 3.0 or something like that. Um, when do you think we are at the stage where you could prompt your way uh, to a Hollywood movie? Oh, 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 this is where I, I become useless because it's, uh, I would say, judging by how harshly Hollywood has reacted to Sora, I would say sooner rather than later, right? So let, let me give you a small example, which is still not answering your question. But there is a, um, a company that does upscalers. So they started upscaling images with AI, and then they applied the same thing into video. Now, their upscalers for images 
which, as I said before, is not an interpolation which makes the image quality less, is an extrapolation which makes the, the image even better than what was shot can happen, right? Because it depends on the algorithms. So if we go and see what is happening now, their algorithms are embedded in DaVinci Resolve now as a plugin, which is a standard industry software. So it also depends on how fast Hollywood will or will not embrace this technology, right? Because they could use it to create their own mixed models, where it's still not just Gen AI, it's Gen AI, humans, uh, traditional shooting techniques, and so on and so forth. So the final result should be that your question, which is difficult to answer, is where will we see a movie that has been entirely generated in the box, so there's no shooting involved at all? And when will we see that movie winning an Oscar? That's, that's the most interesting question. I would say when you will see a movie that is entirely generated, that can happen in two years, for sure. When will it win an Oscar? It's an entirely different game. I would predict, and you know, uh, it, it, it's really, really a, sh a shot in the dark. I would say 10 years is a reasonable amount of time to see this technology projected into the highest end of the spectrum, given the, the, how quickly, but it depends also how much resistance it will find, right? So it, I cannot give you an absolute answer. I would say theoretically 10 years, and it could never happen if, the, if Hollywood blocks the way or refuses to adopt, it could slow it down to the point of creating a firewall that will never be surpassed. So go going back to the opportunities for, for small and medium-sized businesses in, in advertising, do you see anything stopping or, or blocking uh, the development and, and the possibility for them to adopt AI in, in advertising? Honestly, no. Honestly, no. I have a request though, so not use it to pollute with mediocre assets because that will damage the whole industry. So there is an ongoing discussion around the quality of what we see. And this is again linked to all the, all the tech uh, revolutions. More people will be able to produce better assets it doesn't mean a better asset or an asset means it's a good asset, right? So if all of a sudden our space, virtual or physical, gets polluted by thousands of mediocre Gen AI works, it's a horrible world we don't want to see. So use it now, but use it again with a grain of salt, which is let me try to get something meaningful out of this, not just for the sake of creating assets put some love and effort in crafting a message that will not pollute the ecosystem and then and then we are good. Then it's just execution and it doesn't really matter. I think that is very good advice. Um, I actually wrote an article on, on this challenge uh, exactly because what we've seen with social media, Facebook and Instagram, has often been that companies, they like to make these social media calendars, posting something new every day. And I've always said, you know, that that's not marketing. I mean, best case, it's some form of communication, right? Because if, if you want people to actually remember something and act on something, you need to create something great and then show it to them quite a number of times to get an impact, not make a thousand assets and show them uh, them once, right? Look, that, that's the old, the old Byron Sharp discussion, which we can have another time, which is fascinating, is... Because I, I see merits in, in both positions. Um, I would say sometimes companies do social media without even realizing or having a strategy for that and a clear set of results they can measure. So don't do something for the sake of doing it. The simple fact that you can doesn't mean you should. So even there, and I mentioned like targeting, accurate targeting which is super powerful, but then you have to have meaningful messages for each one of those targets, which means researching each target audience to get the, the right insights, the right cultural nuances, the right 
crafting of the message. So to a way, yes, you could produce a hundred assets easily now, but do you have the brain power to produce a hundred meaningful messages that will eventually influence your PNL? That's a different story altogether. So don't use Gen AI as, okay, I have to do it because everyone is doing it or, oh, fantastic. Now I can do those a hundred different assets campaign. Do it meaningfully and not all the time. Sometimes you just need one asset. And as you said, hammering on the same asset for a sufficient number of times so that people acknowledge it instead of outputting um, a storm of assets that n will not sediment in our consumers' uh, opinion of the brand. Thank you, Alex. I, I think this is a, a great way to end. Like AI is a tool like any other. It needs to be used correctly to, to be efficient. But definitely, it's, it's a huge opportunity for, for small and medium businesses to level up their advertising if, if they're willing to explore and, and use it correctly. 